privilege of doing the very last session uh, of, of Sunday school lessons that in theory are about this book, about this book that's written by this dude, Mark Driscoll. But really this book and this whole session is, uh, or the whole series of Sunday school lessons that you have been going through. Thank you. You notice my Jedi reflexes are still working. Um, has been from the book of Ephesians, which is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church in Ephesus. So, um, with, with my lovely, oh, I forgot that we videotaped this. Do you mind if I just sit this way? Because from this way, I look a little fat on my chin. You do not. You zoom out. Good, back it out. We will get in ditch a little. Uh, okay, sorry for that distraction. So, um, I, uh, I did learn my lesson from the last time I was here, and I tried to put as much in for much of the scripture and other things in PowerPoint, so that I'm going to ask several of you to read the passage that uh, that we have today. Uh, but before that, I want to give you a quick reminder. So you have had uh, a whole bunch of lessons um, from the book of Ephesians, taught by a whole bunch of uh, great people, better than me. Uh, the last one, last week was my friend Craig Minnick was here, wasn't he? Uh -huh. For those of you that were here. Uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, so I get, uh, I'm thrilled to have the last section of Ephesians. So today I want to just uh, do three quick things. One, I'm going to give you a quick summary of, of uh, a little background on Ephesians <coughs> and who Paul was writing to. Then we're going to read the passage, and I want you to pay attention because I'm going to ask you to give me some feedback after we read it. This is like the last uh, few verses of the book of Ephesians. And, um, and, uh, and then we'll talk about it because this is where the book gets a little bit weird. And today we're going to talk about a part of our, uh, of our faith. When we claim to be Christians, there are some pretty fantastic things that we believe or some pretty uh, things that to the rest of the world look a little uh, out there. A little crazy. And today we're going to talk about one of those things, uh, the subject of a spiritual battle. And so, uh, and Paul writes this letter to the church in Ephesus. So, uh, Chris, page through a couple of pages here. Um, you can skip that one. Uh, so, Paul wrote this letter to some people in Ephesus, which I don't know if you can see that, but Ephesus is still there today. It's in Turkey. Has anyone ever been to Turkey? It's a big tragedy there this last week. Um, so uh, Paul wrote this to uh, the church in Ephesus. So Ephesus to them in the Roman world was kind of like Chicago is to us today, right? Like uh, in those days, Rome was the cool, the most populated and the, the center of all activity. Like in North America, we would the analogy would be New York. And there was a city in uh, Egypt called Alexandria that was... Uh, on the beach and uh, was also a center that's sort of analogous to our Los Angeles, right? So New York, LA, and then there's Chicago, this highly populated place that's famous for a lot of uh, things and <coughs> Ephesus was kind of that, that's who Paul was writing to, a church that was in, in the ancient Chicago uh, basically. And it was famous because there they, they worshipped this um, idol uh, named uh, Artemis or Diana. I won't bore you with all the exciting things, but there's a little picture of her there in the bottom right. The weird thing was she was like a kind of a fertility god, and so uh, she had a lot of breasts, and uh, and those are there in that statue, which is kind of disturbing, but, uh, but that's who they worship. So the next slide gives you a little more background. So Paul lived there uh, in Ephesus for three years, and while he was there, in a moment, we're going to read some fantastic things that happened while Paul was there. And these are important to, this, to the passage we're going to read in the letter today. But um, it's, the, it's the one place where Paul stayed the longest. So, you know, he went on a bunch of missionary journeys, <coughs> and traveled around the ancient world, and he moved from place to place frequently. But this city is where he stayed the longest. So he was there for three years. He healed people and had miraculous things happen. He built a lot of satellite churches that were nearby. Um, and he, uh, he caused such a stir. Remember, this is like a big city, kind of like our Chicago. He got enough attention there 
that he changed, uh, they had a whole industry worshiping that uh, fertility goddess, uh, Artemis. And uh, Paul, had, his ministry had such a drastic impact that people stopped worshiping that idol. And so all of the guys, the blacksmiths and the uh, sculptors, the people that made their living from making all these little uh, uh, Princess Diana uh, or uh, Artemis um, things, they made their living by making these things and nobody wanted to buy them anymore. So these guys got all kinds of ticked off at Paul, and they started a riot. And Ephesus had one of the largest theaters, which there's a picture of it there, that would hold 25,000 people. That's about 6,000 more than the Sprint Center will hold. And the city got in such a riot that they filled that place, and they wanted to kill, they wanted to stone Paul and his friends. And there was a big drama, and, uh, uh, and he was spared, and... Anyway, I won't bore you with that whole story, but uh, or with any more of it than that. But this is the place to whom Paul is writing. So go to the next slide. Uh, and so you can't really read this on the far right, but uh, so Paul spent three years in Ephesus. Then he left and went on another uh, journey. And about three years later, about six years after he was in Ephesus, he got arrested in Rome. And he had kind of a nice arrest, uh, actually. They let him live in a house, and um, he wrote letters. So he wrote this letter that we're reading, that you've been reading for a whole semester, while he was in prison. And, um, and so uh, this letter is unlike all the rest of his letters. He wrote a bunch of letters, uh, like two-thirds of the New Testament was written by Paul. And, uh, and this letter was not written for a specific purpose. Most of his letters were written to say, hey, dummies, you should know that, you know, here's some heresy or some stupid thing that you're doing. But this one doesn't have that. Uh, this letter is just a letter to uh, write encouragement um, to his friends, the people that he labored with and ministered with more than any others. So we're going to read like 14 verses, and I'm going to ask Bo Foster with his brand new cool uh, Buddy Holly glasses to... Uh, to read this passage for us, which I hope uh, it's Ephesians 6, 10 through 24. So this is like four pages worth of, uh, but I want you to pay attention because when we're done, I want to ask you for your opinions. What do you hear and read and see in here that either causes a question in your mind or sounds odd? Or what do you think the most important thing is we're supposed to get out of it? So Bo, in a loud and clear voice so that the world can hear you. Finally be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for one, for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given, may be given me so that I will be fearless, make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in the chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Tychicus, Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending for you to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Thank you, Bo. Read with uh, passion and vigor. Thank you. Uh, okay, so it's a long passage. I hope while Bo was reading beautifully, you paid attention and uh, 
and can give me some feedback. What is it that you notice about this passage? What's it all about? <coughs> What's the main point? Armor of God. Who said that? That's good. Uh, excellent. What else do you notice? He didn't just encourage them, but he also asked for prayers for himself, like he's not making himself better than them. He's saying, I did this too. That's a really good point. And prayer is, uh, is, is what he asks for. That's a really excellent point. You're jumping to all of the key things. What else? If um, earlier I said this is the, this, we're going to talk a little bit today about the part of Christianity that sometimes is a little hard to swallow. What do you think I'm getting at by saying that? What 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 is uh, what about this passage uh, would lead you lead me to say something like that? Uh, talking about the spiritual battles. Yes, exactly. He talks about armor. He talks about being prepared for battle. Um, so, what what is he talking about? Is he talking about a literal physical fight, uh, Mr. Moore? No. Shook it through your head. What is he talking about? Do you know? A fight inside of us. A fight inside of us. Yeah, that's that's uh, an excellent uh, point, and that's what we want to talk about today. So the the um, uh, the series uh, in Ephesians that um, uh, that has been guiding us. May I set this on the drum? Is that going to cause damage? Um, is uh, the idea here, the last thing that, that Paul tells us after he's told us all kinds of things in this letter, that you are Christ's child, that you are uh, forgiven, that you are blessed, that you are equipped, the final thing he tells us is you are victorious. You are, uh, you are going to win the war. And he talks here, he refers to a war. And uh, that's this is the heart, this is where... Um, we're going to uh, get a little weird, but he's talking about a spiritual war. He's talking about uh, something that in their culture they knew about, but to us it's difficult. It's something for uh, hard for us to figure out. But to um, uh, to the next century, or rather to the first century uh, people in Ephesus, they had seen this firsthand. <coughs> so I'll read the next uh, thing. Uh, from Acts 19, uh, Chris, the next one, yeah. So this is from the book of Acts that describes what happened when Paul was in Ephesus. So earlier, we just read a long passage from the letter that Paul wrote. Now, we're reading about what happened six years earlier when Paul was in Ephesus. And, and uh, the writer of Acts says, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. So, so these, his handkerchief was almost like it had poison ivy oil on it, right? If you've ever had poison ivy in your home, like we have in ours this week, you know that if any garment touched the poison ivy plant and got the oil on it, and then that same garment touched you, you're infected. Well, the opposite, the reverse happened for Paul. Even his handkerchief could be laid on someone who was ill and they were healed. This is like miraculous, weird stuff that we don't see every day. Uh, some, in verse 13, some Jews went around driving out evil spirits. Also not something we see a lot of in Johnson County, at least that I know of. Uh, went around driving out evil spirits and they tried to invoke the name of Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. And I left this in because it's just kind of funny, I think. So these demons, so these, uh, these guys are going around uh, trying to cast out demons. And the demons would respond, um, the, or the guys casting out the demons would say, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. And these seven sons of a Jewish priest were doing this. And one day an evil spirit answered them, and the spirit said, Jesus I know... And I know about Paul, but who are you? And go to the next slide. And then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, these seven men, seven guys were trying to cast out an evil spirit. Uh, he jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleak. Isn't that sad? But, but that's kind of a, uh, a strrange thing, right? The, 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 the spiritual world meets the physical world. 
uh, at least back in Ephesus. When this became known, the Jews and the Greeks that were living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in very in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And when they calculated the value of the scrolls that came to 50,000 drachmas, which is a whole lot of money, uh, and in this way the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. So when Paul writes to them about this spiritual battle and this armor that they need to put on, he is talking about an actual war that is taking place between, between God's agents and Satan's agents. And he means it is a literal war. It is a, there are literal beings in a spiritual world that we can't see that are at war. And he is, Paul is claiming in this letter that we, humans, have some impact on that war. This is the fantastic, weird part that, that a lot of people, when they get around to this part of Christianity, they want to roll their eyes and say, okay, now this is the cartoon part. This is the part I don't really want to have to believe because I've never seen it. I don't understand it. And it seems fantastic. It seems like just a story that someone wrote. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time today convincing you of the reality of it. I'm just going to point to the fact that Paul believed it was true. The people that were reading this letter, they had experienced what you just read about. They had seen the places where the spiritual world crosses over into the physical world. I'm watching my son Mitch fall asleep right now. Uh, yeah, I know. It's, it's just soothing over there. I can see how that would happen. Um, uh, I, I just, his eyes. Um, this, he is losing the spiritual battle right now. Uh, uh, so, the, um, and the, uh, we don't have time to look at it, but the, uh, the Hebrews, the Jews, the people from Israel that would have lived in Ephesus, and there was a prominent group of people there who were Jewish. Um, Jewish people of that age, they understood this very well. Uh, they, have, they, they all had the prophet Daniel. And if we had time to go back and look uh, in the book of Daniel, we would read all of these amazing visions that Daniel had where the Lord opened his eyes and gave him a view into the spiritual world. And he uh, was also given a vision of the future in that spiritual world. But in those visions, Daniel saw the forces of evil, Satan and his minions, demons, literally at war, hand-to-hand, mano-a-mano combat with angelic forces. And I know this all sounds a little weird, but Paul is telling us in this letter that we have something to do with that war. That it... That uh, that it has to do with us. And, and, and we are, um, Chris, you're going to have to go to like, I don't know, page 12. Uh, what is our role in the war is the title. Uh, yeah, we are two things. Uh, we are the objects for which the war is taking place. These angelic beings are fighting over Wade Grants. They are fighting over every one of us. They're fighting for your life and your destiny and they want you each side wants you to join them i know this sounds fantastic but this is what the bible speaks as the truth and so we are two things we are uh objects of the fight that is uh, humanity is what the fight is all about or is partly about and we are combatants we're participants in this war and that's what paul is telling us here you need to be ready you need to be prepared to uh, compete. And, uh, and what does he say our charge is? I'm going to go back and read it, but because I love it. It seems so simple, right? If you were going to war, you would want, wouldn't you want, you know, General Patton to give you a stirring speech that says your goal is to eradicate the enemy. Your goal is to take this hill. Your goal is to dominate a city, or your goal is to um, what, take over the bank, or whatever. Um, but Paul says uh, in Ephesians, in this passage that we just read, um, 
He says in verse 12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the authorities and the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And, after you have done everything, to stand. That's all he says. The goal of this war is for you to survive, to stand. It sounds underwhelming, doesn't it? If you're going to go fight a war, you want to dominate. You want to, you want to you know, have some goal. But he says that your goal here, by putting on the armor, is to survive, to put up with, and to stand. Now, of course, there's another meaning to that. To stand is more than just to survive. If you're the last one standing in the battle, you have won, right? And so I put this little picture of William Wallace for everyone who's ever watched uh, the, 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 the um, Braveheart. Thank you, Braveheart. Uh, uh, there are several great scenes in there where William Wallace uh, and his men, not always just him, but they remain standing. And that is the sign of victory, that, that you stand. So let's uh, briefly analyze what Paul has to say about how we are to fight this battle. Uh, and I'm going so quickly that I'm uh, losing myself. So he says, be strong in, in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. And then what is that armor? So I have a few slides that will describe that. Go to how to fight the belt of truth. So he gives us these five or six things that I'll only briefly uh, talk about. Why? Uh, so he says, put on the belt of truth. Why does he pick a belt? And you can't see it very well, but I've put in a little picture here on the right um, of a Roman soldier. Because the people to whom Paul is writing this letter in Ephesus they would all recognize a Roman soldier. The Romans dominated the world at that time. And um, so people would have seen a Roman soldier. And, and so I tried to uh, show you here that a belt is, uh, is like the most fundamental piece of equipment that the soldier has on. Uh, stay there, uh, go back a line, Chris. Um, it actually protects. And in those days, they, the, the belt actually had all this leather stuff that would hang in the front and the back that protected some good parts. And, um, and also the belt uh, uh, is something from which everything else hangs. He would hang his sword there. And so, uh, so Paul makes the analogy that we should equip ourselves with the truth, that we should know what is true, that we should be able to say and speak what is true, and everything else that is, is going to help us in this battle hangs off of that thing, the truth. So it's important for you to know what's right, to know the difference between right and wrong, and to be able to uh, consistently live it. it needs, your life needs to reflect the truth, and everything else hangs off of that. So the next slide is, uh, he describes the breastplate of righteousness. So you can see there the guy has totally cut uh, abs, uh, underneath that um, usually metal uh, breastplate. And uh, it, it, the idea uh, on the soldier is it protects all of your most vital organs, uh, or almost all, uh, everything except your brain. Uh, what, what, the, what you consider your vital organs are all uh, here. And the breastplate of righteousness uh, protects all of those organs. And so, uh, so that's what the breastplate does. And righteousness is it's just what the name kind of implies. It's living right. Living without sin. I know it sounds like an easy, totally Sunday school answer that if you want to do well in the spiritual battle, you will avoid sin. But sin, if you take off, if you don't protect yourself from sin, if you don't have protection against sin, it cuts to your most internal organs, your most vital part of your life. If sin is in your life, uh, you have you have allowed your you have exposed yourself in the same way that a soldier if he took off his breastplate he would be susceptible to any injury uh, that could become uh, life threatening so living right avoiding sin and when sin is in your life the habit of 
confession, repentance, and restoration has to be an integral part of how we live. That's how we prepare ourselves for the spiritual battle. The next slide is the, uh, this great word, shod, with the gospel. Shod means, I have shoes on. Uh, so the, your, your shoes uh, represent the gospel. Well, why, uh, why the gospel? Um, or rather, why shoes to represent the gospel? Having uh, a soldier needs protection for his feet. Without it, he can't move. If any of you uh, have done any serious hiking, or uh, you know that uh, if you don't have good footwear, if you've got bad blisters, if your feet are not well taken care of, you're not going to go very far. Mitch and I have learned this firsthand as we've prepared for a 12-day hiking trip this summer and uh, realized that if you don't have good hiking boots, you're dead meat. And in the same way, if you don't have a clear understanding of the good news, why is it good news that Jesus became a man and lived on this earth? If you don't understand that, if you aren't able to explain it, at least to yourself, if not to your friends, uh, you can't move very far in this spiritual battle. You can't be active. You've got to understand the good news, the thing that separates Christianity from everything else. And so uh, uh, the gospel is our footwear in the spiritual battle. All right, the next slide is uh, the shield of faith. The shield, of course, is primarily a defensive protection. The Romans at the time, they carried very big shields. Their shields were about uh, three feet wide and almost four feet tall. So it was like carrying a piece of plywood around. But they, uh, they curved it so that it would blunt the blows of uh, arrows and attacks. And in the same way, uh, having faith uh, does the same for us. It protects us from the blows of our enemy in the spiritual battle. And faith is, uh, another word for faith is just confidence. Knowing for sure that I, I, I put in this uh, verse from Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith is having confidence in God. And that faith, uh, that confidence in God is what protects us from the attacks of our enemy. All right, Chris, next one, please. The helmet of salvation is a uh, helmet uh, protects your mind if you're a... The reason they uh, wore helmets, of course, uh, if you lose your head, uh, you're done, right? Uh, um, and, uh, and not only just losing your head, but a, um, but a blow to the head, even though it may not kill you, it can make you dizzy, it can make you uh, 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 dis, uh, confused, like I sort of am sometimes. Uh, but a blow to the head, so um, this idea of having the confidence that you are saved, that God has saved you, that the ultimate victory uh, is yours, allows you to keep a clear head. So as you're living this life, and as you deal with whatever spiritual battles are going to come across your path, that the confidence of knowing that you have been saved uh, keeps your mind clear. All right, next slide. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. This great analogy of... Uh, the, uh, the most offensive weapon that the Roman soldier carried was his sword. And if he was experienced, he used it for both defensive purposes, but primarily for offensive purposes. <coughs> when a Roman soldier was involved in hand-to-hand -hand combat, if you were going to lose, the like you would lose because you had been cut to the marrow by, uh, by the Roman sword. And, and in the same way, your ability as a spiritual warrior to know the word of the Lord and use it as, in an, in, as an experienced way as a Roman soldier would use his sword, that is our offensive weapon. You, you've heard a couple of times from uh, Craig Minnick, you know, I know uh, very few other people in my life that have committed so much of the word of God to memory that uh, I've been in the room with Craig Minnick when he has been with people who are going through um, significant spiritual battles, either whatever, marriage trouble, financial trouble, and uh, the Lord uses the Word of God that Craig has committed to his mind 
it comes out at just the right time and, uh, and in such a way that it has a drastic and amazing impact in the lives of the people around him because it is, uh, it is the sword of the Spirit. It, is, uh, it, it, cuts, uh, it cuts through all of the nonsense uh, that's around us and the, and the attacks of the enemy. So the sword of the Spirit, it, it's important for us, if we're going to fight the spiritual battle, to be aware, uh, to know the Word of God. Uh, memorize it, study, analyze it, and apply it in your own life. Next. And final. Uh, I've, I've left one thing out. In the final part of this passage, the Apostle Paul says, uh, uh, one of you called him out. He says, pray for me. Pray always in the Spirit. And it's this idea of communication. If you're, if you're in a battle, and of course none of us have ever been in a real, probably, never been in a, uh, in a real battle. But when you are, communication with the other combatants is very important. Communication is among the most important things. If we're fighting together, I need to know what your plan is, and you need to know what my plan is. And so, and prayer is the way that we communicate with God. And that has got to be an integral part of our lives. And Paul is calling his friends in Ephesus to pray. He, earlier in, earlier in the book, uh, in the first chapter, you may not remember this, but many months ago, you, you learned about how uh, Paul prays for the Ephesians. And uh, he's now asking them to pray for him. I'm in prison. I need deliverance. And so uh, that's an integral part of, uh, of preparing for spiritual warfare. So um, the important thing that I've only casually mentioned, uh, and because we didn't go back and read the passages in the book of Daniel, but remember Daniel is what I told you, the prophet from the Old Testament, who God gave all these visions of the spiritual world to well, one of several of those visions clearly describe the fact that the end is already decided. God revealed to Daniel the result of the spiritual war. And you already know the answer. God's side wins, right? So if you have chosen to be a Christian, to be a disciple of Jesus, you already know that you're on the winning team. But there is a very real battle that you can't see, and it's kind of hard to think about because it's like a science fiction movie or a cartoon, like I said earlier. But your life has an impact in that battle. And that battle, as someone else over here said, is taking place in some ways inside you. Those combatants are fighting for your soul and for you to join one side or the other. And once you've decided, it is your responsibility to be a good soldier and equip yourself and yourself in the way that Paul asks us to here. All right. Thank you for your patience and uh, indulgence as we've raced through uh, this little passage. Let me, uh, if I may, I'll close this in prayer. And then, are we done, Corey? Or is there some? We're problem? done. Except to go to Revolution, which we need to go to Revolution. To talk to Tim Brock. So, Tim, the everybody, everybody will talk. To him. All right, let me say a, a, a quick prayer for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this picture and reminder of this world that uh, is so hard for us to uh, imagine and recognize. But we believe, Lord, and we, we understand that it is real. And that you, you left into these words for us so that we would know that it's real. So that we would know how to prepare ourselves and protect ourselves. And to be... Uh, involved in the spiritual battle. I pray for everyone here, Lord, for whatever battles and, and difficulties are going on in the lives of every person here, I ask God that you would, uh, would reach into those situations, that you would uh, prepare those of us here uh, who are involved in those battles to be, uh, to be your ambassador, to, be, uh, to carry the gospel of peace uh, into every one of those situations. We trust you, Lord, for the results. We thank you for the victory that you have already promised, that you already bring. And we lift this up in your son's name. Amen. Amen.